Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schinder here on Drum Talk TV. Tell us where you're watching from. I'm way up in the mountains in Globe, Arizona, about 100 miles east of Phoenix here on Drum Talk TV with a first time guest who I know will be coming back because he's legendary and there's so much to talk about. There's no way we'll squeeze it into one episode. Merle Percolator Perkins coming to us from <laughs> Chicago. Merle, welcome. Well, man, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank I think you. I've been waiting for this all my life. Yeah, we've been talking about this for <laughs> yeah, for a long yeah, time, and I'm glad yeah, we, yeah. we finally have it together. Yeah. Um, and folks, tell us where you're watching from. And if you want me to relay questions, I will. I have my questions up oh, roll here yeah. at the top of my head. And I have yeah. my monitor here, so I'll be watching the show. So when you see me look over here, I'm not watching the Flintstones or the ball game. I'm watching <laughs> Merle and I, just like you guys are. So tell, chime in, tell us where you're watching from. I'll give some shout outs. Merle, I have so many questions, but where I really want to start is, I know you were in drum corps, but what happened before drum corps? Did you start playing drums before you had that sort of formal training, or did you start right off in drum corps and how old were you when you started well actually my mom you know i had no sisters or brothers at all so she raised me by herself wow and uh, she said every time she would take me to the parade and the uh, drums come out and i would start stomping my feet uh more and more as the drums got louder and you know and uh, then you know I, I was born in kansas city kansas so uh, what happened is uh, my mother met a boyfriend and he got a job in St. Louis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And I moved to uh, St. Louis, Missouri in 1956. So I happened to be out playing in the yard and I seen this drum corps uh, walking in a straight line. And, I, and they went over to, a, it, it was a school there and they started practicing. So I followed them over there and um, I was still young then, you know, I think I was, uh, I don't know, 14 or something like that. And I said, man, I really like the drums. I'd like to do that. And so uh, as the years back went by, you know, we stayed in St. Louis. I happened to move uh, uh, from one part section of St. Louis and move into another part of St. Louis. And then where I moved at, they used to have um, a parade that would march uh, past close to where I, where I was at. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a, a church called Ple uh, Pleasant Green. I was at, well, a church drum corps I was in in 1962 called uh, Pleasant Green Drum and Bugle Corps, a very small drum corps. And when we marched in parades, uh, and and when we get to the end, uh, when I seen the spirit of St. Louis, there was an all uh, Afro American senior corps. Nice. And I said, man, I want to be a those cats there because they were a very popular drum corps. So back then, um, there you know processes and pump pump doors, all that was in style. So right. I had a pump a door, you know, a drum corps was more like military. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when I was in Pleasant Green, I played tenor drum. I wanted to play snare, but I was kind of a little bit scared of the snares on there. So I picked tenor was a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I happened to do, I went to the Spirit of St. Louis drum, uh, uh, drum corps practice, and I told them I wanted to join. And they said, uh, uh, we you sorry man i'm gonna have to tell you you had to cut all that hair off you know because this is like military so i went to the barber and i cut all my hair off and i had no hair i was like ball here and i came back and they said man it's kind of serious about being in the drum corps so that's where it started that's in awesome. st louis missouri and you know they teach you how to read and practice so I joined them, you know, I had a chance to play in uh, different cities. And I thought that the Spirit of St. Louis was the only Afro-American drum corps in existence. Ah, uh, but it's not. I'm pulling up a picture of you. You could talk about it. This is a picture. I'm going to circle Merle in case you can't see his 
his name at the bottom, but this is 1963. I'm circling with my mouse here, the cursor. You were 18, and that was in Wisconsin, right? Yeah, that was in Plymouth, Wisconsin. Uh, the guy that took that picture was named Charles Payne. And fortunately, uh, he had some more pictures, and I had my band then, so I had sent him some promo pictures. And back then, I had cassette tapes of my band, and I sent it to him. But unfortunately, he got sick and got on a treadmill, and, and suddenly he passed away. So I didn't get none of the rest of the pictures of the drum corps. Oh. And that picture was a little small picture, mm -hmm. and I had it, it was in color. Oh. And uh, I just made it into a big picture, but then me and my mom, we stayed in a basement, a basement apartment and it got flooded and that, that kind of destroyed that, oh. that photo, it took split half and two. And a friend of mine said, I know somebody could put that back together for you. You know, wow. you won't be, be I never color. would have known. Yeah, man. He took that picture right there. He took that picture and it cost me a uh, hundred and twenty-seven dollars, and he fixed it up like it was never nothing wrong with it, but it was in black and white. But it looks great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this: fast forward from drum corps to whatever point you want to to explain this. How how did your drum corps? learnings and the chops that you built in drum corps translate to the drum kit and what were some of the first things you played as a drum set drummer did you start with the blues and the shuffle and and all those things or did you start in a different area of music and gravitate towards blues what was that kind of arc like for you musically well actually when i was sent in st louis a friend of mine influenced me to uh come to Chicago. And so in 1964, I moved to Chicago because they, back then they said, if you can't make it in Chicago, you can't make it nowhere, you know? Right. So what happened when I was here, I, I, I just worked jobs. I didn't even think about playing a drum set. I worked at Hertz for rental car, skill tubes. Uh, I did everything, making the semi lines and making lamps and stuff like that. So what happened is um, I um, met a singer, his name was Joe Cato, and uh, he used to perform, and I used to go and watch him perform. I would be backstage and watch him perform, and I would just beat in the chair. And he came, he said, man, you got some good hands. He said, why don't you try to learn how to play a set? So I kind of took that and considered it. I said, yeah, man, I'm going to try that. So what I did, I just I was working for Hertz Rental Car. I had a big old jar of coins, and on 43rd Street in Chicago, I went to a pawn set. I had a little cheap set called a Beverly set, and I bought that set. And then my mother stayed in a basement apartment, so I just started practicing. The first song I practiced on was a song called "The Hearts." Mm. It was instrumental on one side and singing on the other side. That was when I had 45 records. Yeah, I remember those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Barely. I want to give some <laughs> shout outs real quick before you continue okay. your answer. Um, Escar Rosa says, Hola, saludo desde México. Hola, como estas, Escar? And then Jonathan Robles says, Greetings from New York. Fast tempo might do the trick. <laughs> cool. So, what did your mom think when you brought home a drum set in a basement apartment? Well, actually, um, I think she, she didn't say anything about me doing it because, see, my mother used to be, when I was younger, she was a singer like Sarah Vine. Oh, wow. And she, she used to make her clothes, and I, I remember her making her own clothes. And so I think maybe I got a little music background for her being a singer like Nancy Wilson, Sarah Vine. Nice. And stuff like that. So, um, but what happened when I started practicing – Somebody in the building didn't like it. They called the police on me. <laughs> and the police came and knocked on the door and said, hey, man, somebody don't like drums, you know. Did so, you tell the police they should go arrest that person for not liking drums? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just did what the police told me to do. But then later on, 
I said, man, I'm, I'm going to practice again. I'm going to go ahead. So I did it again, started practicing, and the police came again. But this time they told me, they said, by law, you can practice on an instrument from 10 in the morning till 10 at night. Yep. What did they tell me that for? <laughs> uh, I started practicing. And then after I had went and bought that set, I met a drummer coming out of the pawn shop. His name was Leonard Mayfield. And um, he was playing. And I went to a gig to hear him play. And he just blew me away. He was like kind of like a big band drummer. And then he played in a jazz band. And, and his... I just started following him everywhere he went. And, you know, and uh, he said, one day, man, he said, one day, you know, your hands are good. One day you're, you're going to be a famous drummer, you know. And uh, what happened, he started taking me to the jam sessions. Oh. And um, to the blues jam session as I got into blues. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started going and and setting in, you know, trying to learn how to play the blues. And uh, one day, a uh, buddy guy had a club that's on 43rd called the Checkerboard Lounge. You probably heard of it. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, Led Zeppelin, um, uh, uh, the Rolling Stones, you just come there, you know, and, you know, Muddy Waters is from Chicago and stuff, you know. Yeah. So uh, it was a club on the corner called Peppers. So I went and sat in on the drums, and uh, I was playing the wrong beat on the drums, and they, and they stopped the music and came and took me off the drum set. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so it hurt my feelings, and I got kind of angry about it. And, but see, they didn't know I could read music. So I said, man, I'm going to fix them. And then one day I was looking at TV, and I seen my biggest orchestra, and I seen Billy Cobham in the set in the seventies playing. I had never seen an Afro American play double bass drums, and he sounded like a machine. Yeah, was it Mike Fushner uh, Orchestra that you saw? Yeah, he's playing with John McGovern. Yeah, legendary. So, yeah, so I said, you know, it ain't nobody on the blues set playing double bass drums. And I said. I went into the music store and I started buying sets with all Mitch Mack. And then back there, they had like on the ceilings, you know, you could buy uh, ceiling paper that looked like wood. Mm -hmm. So I took all the hardware off, put that wood on there, and uh, had four times and two floor times. And I put some, uh, put it all together, and it had some stuff that was like. Not varnish was making stuff shine, but it has some stuff called flecto vera flare. Mm. I don't even know if they even got that, but you would spray it and it would make uh wait 24 hours and it looked real shiny like a set. And I put all the hardware back, just went in the woodshed and started practicing on the double bass drums. And then I met some other guys, uh, I mean, it was Sammy Fender and Charles Taylor, which was kin to Coco Taylor queen of the blues mm -hmm. so they i started that was the first band i started playing with the double bass drums and then my first professional gig was with a band called joe ferguson and the vibratones mm. that was my first trip and they didn't play blues so we went to grand rapids michigan and uh it was our head there so we got there a little late, parked on the side of the building, and we had to sit up real quick, sit in and play. When we finished the first set, we went back out to the truck. Man, somebody broke in the truck. They took everything. We didn't have no clothes, drawers, everything. Oh, wow. <laughs> everything. So we had four nights at that club, and we had to play in the same clothes. Oh, uh, well, that's okay. It would have looked like your <laughs> outfit. Like, these are our outfits. Right? <laughs> hey, yeah. I, Merle, I want to show everybody a clip. Um, I'm going to bring up a clip. You won't see it, but the audience will. Okay. And, and we'll be quiet while they're watching. Otherwise, they'll hear us talking about them. Okay. <laughs> and this is uh, Merle from the 80s at um, the Monterey Jazz Festival. 
playing with James Cotton. Check out this groovy Chicago blues shuffle. Check this out. Music is just a little too cool, I think. <laughs> those, those were yeah. the days. What, what? Gosh, where do I go with this? So I guess what I want to ask is, you gigged a lot. You've played in 22 countries. Most people can't name more than five. Most Americans are like, okay, the U.S., Canada, Mexico, Italy and Alaska, <laughs> but you've played in 22 countries in every state except for two, Hawaii and Arizona, correct? Uh, Alaska. Alaska, Alaska. So yeah. being that you gigged so much, was there a particular place that you loved gigging the most where you always looked forward to the most going back when you saw it on the itinerary? Was there something different about the ambiance or the, the venues or the audience? Uh, the, the, the most place I really like playing is Canada. Really? And, and the reason why I like Canada, because Canada is like a melting pot. You know, it's not sectioned off like the United States, like you got Mexican over here, you got a Puerto Rican over here, and, right. you know. So you got the neighborhood out there, it's called Lincoln Park, and it's kind of mixed up here. Mm -hmm. uh, but Canada, it doesn't matter what nationality you are, you all stay together. Yeah. And, and that, that's what I like about Canada. That's and awesome. the people are so, so nice there, you know. Um, you know, I play Toronto. You know, um, I had a really big, nice look. The first time I worked there was at the, my, you know, my first gig at the, at the plan with Joe Ferguson, the Vibratron. I don't even know how I get the guy gig with Freddie King. Now, Freddie King, you know, was a guitar player way ahead of his time. And what yeah. happened is his drummer was sick. Oh. And so I got the gig with that. I did a four day tour. And we played um, Columbus, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, uh, Columbus, Ohio, big theaters. And I remember playing uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, because that's 71 is when the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates won the World Series. That's right. And uh, we were opening in a show for Leon Russell. Oh, wow. So on, on all, those, all those gigs. Yeah. And, um, and that, you know, I mean, it was, I feel like a king cause see, they had like roadies and, uh, Freddie King had a Broham Cadillac or a big Cadillac. And that's what we rode in. So I feel like a king. Big man, time. Big time. You know, yeah. that's <laughs> and, cool. <laughs> and then when I got back to Chicago, I was sitting in at the checkerboard and then buddy guy, was looking around the corner. I was going to ask he, how you got that gig. He, he was looking around the corner. He said, you playing with anybody? I said, no. He said, would you like to play with me? And that's when Buddy Guy and Junior Will was playing together as a team. Right. So 1976 to 1978, I played with Buddy Guy and Junior Wells, And then playing at the bottom line, which was a very good place in New York City. Mm -hmm. Opening show for Moles Allison. Wow. And um, 
have recordings of that, you know, uh, audios of that. If you go, it's called Wolf Ball. You can go there and people can, I guess they have to pay money to, to listen to that, you know. Yeah. But I, the thing about it, I recorded all that stuff. And that's what a lot of journals, a lot of stuff that I play, play it on. I already recorded my gigs because I wanted to hear what I sound like. Yeah. I, it, it had a sound man to do it. Or then I took a boom box and did it. So a lot of stuff that's live that you hear on my YouTube page is live with Buddy Guy, Junior Wells, is either from the sound people or I recorded it. That's awesome. And, uh, wow. And then uh, the gig, when I was 15 years old and I lived in St. Louis, I used to shoot pool with Albert King when I was 15. Oh, wow. So uh, actually, when he came to Chicago, I heard he was looking for a drummer. And um, and I, I went there, and there was, I played with him in 1980. I went to rehearsal, and I said, you remember me? I used to shoot pool with you. And, you know, he's a big, tall guy. He's like, oh, yeah, I remember you. So then I went on a, a tour with uh, wow. Albert King, and I recorded that. That's awesome. Uh, here's a question for you, Merle. You've played with, you know, James Cotton, Lenny Brooks, Eddie Clearwater for 11 years, Charlie Musselwhite, um, Albert King, of course, Buddy Guy and Junior Wells, Freddie King, and dozens and dozens and dozens more. Other oh, than man. drum corps, who did you play with that you learned the most from as a musician? Uh, well, it was a guy... It was a group, a famous group in Chicago. They were called the Scott Brothers. They were a horn group. They were very popular. And uh, uh, this guy uh, uh, had a band. It was a guy that they, it was the, they, they had, they all looked like a big family. And uh, Scotty and the Rib Chips uh, was a, a guitar player. He the one who took me on his wings and uh, showed me how to play a shuffle. Mm. You know, so uh, they had a little tape recorder of that, but those guys, this was way back when I first started, and I knew those guys, you know, but uh, Scotty, you know, he died of cancer, and then one, one of the other brothers died of, uh, I guess, sick and died, and um, uh, they're still around, you know, and they, they played behind, uh, um, uh, I forget what his name um uh, he made a popular can I change my man uh Tyrone Davis oh yeah they they played behind him you know and uh, it kind of just went on from there you know after playing with Albert King I had got the offer with the gig with Lonnie Brooks mm -hmm. but I always wanted to play Albert King man because when I played with him his plan just sent chill bumps to, through me, you know, and I had an octopus that day. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. When I was playing with him, I was a little afraid because, you know, I heard a lot of things about him. He was mean. He was pretty mean with, uh, with people, you know. Really? And a lot of musicians were afraid of him. And uh, when I rode on the bus, his bus with him, man, you know, we had stopped and I had got a cookie and I got on a bus and the guy said, man, he, he can't eat on the bus. And so I had to get off on the curb and uh, eat the cookie. Then when I got, uh, we stopped another stop, I got a pop. And they said, man, you can't drink no pop on the bus. <laughs> I said, man, what can you do on this bus? <laughs> <laughs> You're right, it. <laughs> <laughs> that Take was a it. Nap. <laughs> but uh, he was pretty mean person, man, you know, like, and I had got offered the gig with Lottie Brooks, and I said, man, I'm going to get this gig with Lottie Brooks. So I called my mom. I told the bass player, I said, man, I can't live, because he was paying $300 a week. He take out income tax, which I never heard of that, $166 out of $300. And then we had to share the room with the rest of the money. I said, I can't stay out here for that. So I just told the bass player, he was there, I said, man, yeah. You know, get another drummer. So the last gig I was going to do with him, some drummer pulled up behind the bus, and I said, well, he, he, he paid me, but um, it was a guitar player named Dion Payton was in there. 
Uh, my mother drove from Chicago to Memphis, Tennessee, and picked us up and took us back to Chicago. And I hooked up with Lonnie Brooks. Nice. And I, I played with Lonnie Brooks for about two years, and I recorded an album with him called Turn On The Night. Mm-hmm. You know? So, uh, I mean, I played with some man, and, uh, you know, playing with Lonnie Brooks and then with James Cotton. You know, James Cotton, uh, his blues are called boogie blues. Yeah. It's very fast. Yeah. Not like regular blues, you know. But I had a hard time playing that shuffle like that because the drummer beforehand was Kenny Kennard. If you listen to the 100% Cotton, uh, James Cotton, it sounds like an old time movie. It sounds like the 40, like you speed it up to it's 78. Uh, yeah. Yeah. His shuffle was that. He was super fast shuffle. But I had to practice. I tried all kinds of drumsticks, man, trying to fit in. But I finally got finally got that shuffle. But it That's took a cool. lot of practice. That's to get awesome. That. Yeah. Let's uh let's show a clip of you. Uh part of a clip of Merle. This is a great angle, too. It's like kind of behind and to his left, playing a solo with a double pedal. And at some point, a spring gets loose, but it doesn't mess up his playing at all. Check this out, folks. is great what i love about that is that you're really economizing your energy your feet look like they're hardly moving yet you hear this da -da 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 -da. was that pretty much your style it was just to play it like butter like that yeah well you know actually where i get the, those triplets on the on the feet is playing over the top of that all kinds of licks and then yeah. keep that going. Dennis Chambers does that. And I basically got it from him, but he started, I think he starts his with the double. Yeah. You know, now the triplet so, sounds cool. It's like that neat ostinato going, and then you're just doing all this other stuff on top. Right, of it. and yeah. playing all around that. Um, and then it was another uh, part of a drum solo. I don't know if you remember a group called Madura. They were no, 1973. Ross Salamone was their drummer. Okay. And I I, I got that album, and I, I still today, I've seen a lot of double bass drum players, but I never heard nobody do a drum solo like that, the way really? he does it. Yeah. Oh, what wow. he would do, he would play a drum solo, and what he'd do, he would slow it down, and then he would take his feet and go real slow and build it up. And then until it goes to a roll, his feet start rolling like, wow. like that. And then he would take his hands, bop, 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 bop. And then his hands would catch up with his feet. Oh, that's cool. And it sounds like an uh, avalanche. <laughs> that's awesome. And I got to look for that. Then he would start asking why that's going on like that. And I never heard a drummer do that that's at all. Cool. What do you think, Merle, of today's music? And I know that's such a broad question because there's so many different genres of music. But let's start with, what do you think of where blues and R&B has gone from like the 60s and 70s until uh, the two, early 2000s till now? Has it evolved much? Has it changed much? Has it morphed into something completely different? Because for me personally, growing up as a little kid in the 60s in Los Angeles, um, there was a radio station that I'd put on headphones when I was seven, eight, nine years old and just play what, to whatever came on. And back then, if you remember, 
at least in LA, music wasn't really that segregated by genre. So there'd be a lot of different things on this. You'd hear Sly and the Family Stone, and then you'd hear Neil Diamond, and then you'd hear Led Zeppelin, then you'd hear Bobby Sherman, then Linda. Ruff. It was all mixed together. And within all that, to me, was real R&B, which stood for rhythm and blues. But by the 90s and the early 2000s, R&B turned into something that had some rhythm, but not much blues. What's your take on that? Well, um, you know, back in the day, um, when I did play in blues and I, and I did a changeover, is that I listened to all t kinds of music. You know, I never just listened to, I listened to Indian music. I listened to the rhythms that they played, I, I, orchestra music, mm -hmm. I, I, even heavy metal, like, uh, you know, the Outlaws and, and um, those big rock groups. And uh, those drummers and those bands are phenomenal, you know. Um, so, but, uh, and I think the person has to, uh, learn at least learn how to play other kinds of music uh, broaden your vocabulary and uh and then i went to frank's drum shop and philip strings was with my teacher because uh you know he he, he i learned how he wrote the drum double bass drum music out so and that's the thing about on a blues set see those guys didn't know i could read music but you know once i started playing double bass drums on the blues set then they was all coming because there wasn't nobody doing that but me. I was the first drummer to do that. But then later on, then the double pedals came out. Right. And I could already play them. Yeah. But then now you got a lot of drums that are playing them, you know. And then there's a new style of, uh, I call it gospel chops. Mm -hmm. that's, another, that's another style of drumming. Right. And, and, and what it is, is... Um, I'm doing is playing rudiments, and they playing the fast single stroke rolls. But Billy is the one that plays singles, man, like that. So that really, they playing not that playing nothing new. A lot of a lot of stuff that drummers play today don't know that that was played a long time ago. Right, right. We were the first one to, to do that. I thought I was the first one that played mallets and until I seen that. Older lady, uh, Viola Smith. Drum. Yeah, yeah, man. I yeah. seen her. I, just, I said, man, she's the first uh, woman yeah. that, that I seen play that. Yeah, we have a video. You know, I interviewed her when she was um 102, yeah. and then uh, my wife and I visited visited with her again when she was 106, shortly wow. before she passed. But there's that video that we play from time to time from 1939, and she has those old style gong drums, and she's playing the yeah. whole set with mallets. And then Ginger Baker did some stuff with mallets in the 60s. And there, there's always a predecessor to, to something. Something always came from something else. And like you said, there's a lot of stuff that's gone on in the last couple decades that I think a lot of younger, not just drummers, but musicians don't realize it's predicated on something that happened 20, 30, 40 years prior. If you look at mm -hmm. what Max Roach did, um, what Papa Joe Jones did, um, uh, Speedy Rufus yeah. Jones, you know, all those guys were doing something that then surfaced as something else in the rock world, you know? I think yeah. that the best example is probably Max Roach's um, bucket of fish that John Bonham adapted with, with Led Zeppelin. And a lot of younger drummers don't realize that when John Bonham, Keith Moon, uh, Ginger Baker, Charlie Watts, they didn't have rock examples because there was no rock for them to play to. They were listening to those older jazz players and they kind of retranslated that, those rudiments in that feel into this other new form of music, which has evolved since then. Right. You know, and, uh, uh, actually, um, you know, like, um, Joe Morello. Yeah. Uh, those cats there, man, Alvin Jones, you know, I got a picture of Alvin Jones. You know, I had a chance to, uh, uh, when I played in Montreal, Canada, a place called Riding Sun. 
this Gillespie came in. Oh wow! And sat in with it. So I had a pleasure of playing behind Dizzy Dizzy Gillespie. Wow! You know, and um, also Big Mama Thornton mm-hmm. came in and and uh, played with us. And um, uh, you know, and the thing I think a person to me hasn't really lived a life. If they haven't seen, if you got a nine to five job, you get a chance to go on vacation. But by being a musician, you get a chance to see uh, what the part of this world looks like. Yeah. You know, uh, different nationalities. I had played country where they don't even speak English, but they just like the blues. Right. And, and, and even the stuff that's going on in Russia, I played in Moscow, Russia, wow. with Eddie Clearwater, with... And, uh, you know, I always dressed up real nice, dressed up in a zook suit. I like the zook suit style, the long coat. Nice. So the first time that I, I played in uh, Moscow, Russia, and I came out just to check the drums out, man, those people went crazy when I came out there on stage, man. They were taking pictures, and then Eddie Clearwater was wondering, what was happening? <laughs> Did this, I guess they'd never really seen a zook suit. Or, you know, had it cocked to the side. And, the, you and, were, at uh, the time, that was such a classic slice of the West for them, in person. Yeah. <laughs> Plus the drummer. Yep. <laughs> With and, all that um, traveling, Merle, where... where uh, I have some traveling questions for you, because like you said, <laughs> when, when you're a musician and a few other professions, you get to see the world, you get out of your element, you see your own element differently, you know, it changes your perspective. Where did you go where you had the best, other than maybe mom's house, where did you go that you had the best food ever? The best food I ever had um, that I really, really like is uh, Istanbul, Turkey. I, really? I, I really? Yeah, I really like the food that they eat because it's, it's not fried, it's healthy, really healthy for you, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, um, and, and I, you know, I got a chance to go to Istanbul, uh, Turkey two times in 1989 with my son Seals and traveled all over them summer cities. I can't even pronounce that we even played, you know. And then the second time I got a chance to go when I got with Eddie Clearwater in 1999. So I got a chance to travel all around in Turkey and, uh, same thing happened. The thing about going when you go overseas, uh, when I played in Italia, which is the capital of Turkey, and when I came off of stage, man, I had about 30 young girls. They surrounded me when I came out of there, and they <laughs> all wanted to kiss me and for autograph. I still got a little brace, the ankle braces that one of them gave me back oh, wow. then. And then uh, the band there uh, went to the Hard Rock Cafe there, and uh, me and the bass player, we sat in with a band. And the club there uh, was closed on Monday. And they said, hey, if you come there Monday, we'll open up. They opened that club for me to come there. So I went to the club, and when I got to the club, the place was jam-packed, man, and it went crazy. And that's the thing about when I go to overseas, man, I get treated like a king. Yeah. And Moscow, Russia, they call me Godfather of the Drums. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know, and I got photos. Uh, they had a club called the BB King um, and went there, and I got a lot of pictures of those guys there and mostly everywhere that I go, you know, and perform, uh, those, those the pe- most of the people, the musicians and stuff, man, it'd be like, man, this guy here, you know, and I guess me playing in, in drum corps because, you know, with so but discipline and then you have to play really relaxed, not right. really chant, and, right. you know, and, uh, Bruce Elock from Alligator Records, which is the biggest record label company here. When I played with Eddie Clearwater, I don't think he never really caught him. Man, he came on. He said, "Man, he said he plays so smooth, like he's like riding in a Cadillac." Nice. 
you know, I never played like really wow, you know, because he's learned that technique to play with the wrist, you know. Yeah. And because Billy plays with his fingers, that's yeah. that's the harder thing. Yeah. You know, but um, it's a lot of countries, you know, like I like the I like Turkey. I like the uh, food in uh, uh, Paris, France, and France. You know, I've been to. I've been to. I mean, all those countries that I've been to, uh, and then I've been on a cruise ship. You know, I got a chance to play behind Honey Boy Edwards. Now, Honey Boy Edwards was the last of the Delta Blues guys. I have a picture of playing with him, and also have a picture uh, uh, I played behind Pine Top Perkins. Mm. which is a legend those cats pass away and and everybody that i recorded with and played with most everybody's passed away yeah uh, I, you know eddie he passed away a few years ago uh i i don't know if you ever heard of sam lay yeah i just went there yeah, i just went he passed away yeah just went to the funeral or you heard of jimmy johnson yeah yeah. Jimmy Johnson made ninety three. Like I'm playing um, ninety um, when he turned ninety two at a place called Blues on Halstead. I sent in with the band and played there. My friend from Brazil, Jeeva, uh, took the pictures of me playing, sitting in with the band, and I played with Jimmy Johnson way back in the early seventies. You know, I played with him. Um, and That's sometimes, cool. I mean, I play with so many people, man. I play with some little people too that are not great big people, but you know, back in the day, man, uh, uh, in Chicago, you make like 50 cent a night and you work, you know, I was kind of playboy and you know, had a woman, I didn't pay no rent, <laughs> <laughs> you know, back in the day, you know, driving, do some quarters and sharp you know stuff like that so but i mean the ladies like me and you know being a musician <laughs> and stuff so um uh, <clears throat> but you know making fifty dollars seven nights a week that's pretty good money because stuff was cheap gas was 27 cents a gallon yeah back then wow and you're you still know? playing and i'm still playing you yeah. know do you like <clears throat> it just as much as you ever have uh, yeah, what the, I tell you, when I had put my band together, because uh, uh, <clears throat> a friend of mine that was married to Chaka Khan, his uh-huh. name is Hassan Khan, he played bass with me. He said, man, you didn't play with her, won't you put your own band together? You know, and I kind of thought about it, and then that's why I, called it, I had a band called Merle Perkins and the Percolators. I did it about seven years, but being a band leader and then i had a woman that we lived together that helped me book she worked for allied band companies and so while i was out of town she would they had the allied call all over and you know and book but then when we broke up i had to do all that on myself you know i didn't have a booking agent or publisher or manager mm-hmm. most everything that i got by me networking getting magazines and uh always posting stuff about yeah. me it's there's a new c- new cd coming out that i just did oh um whenever he comes whenever it comes out we finish it it's got horns on it nice a harmonica player organ piano background vocals all original stuff and he's trying to find a record label to get on you know that's cool. but like I have my own CDs, but I have a guy that does them up real professional because you can't even buy them. So they don't have CDs in the store no more. Yeah, you have to sell them on stage. Yeah, when you perform. You know, so I he didn't want to do that. He said if if I put my music on YouTube and stuff like he said ain't nobody gonna buy it. Now that's not true. Right. You, you got to promote yourself and let that's people right. know who you are. Yeah. Because a, a guitar player get more props than a drummer, and drummers, uh, I think Tony Williams did an article where he read that drummers didn't hardly get noticed because they're in the background. They always notice people up front. Yeah. 
but drummers are the heartbeat of music. Absolutely. Yeah. They're the heartbeat and the bass player is next to that. But yeah. even if the bass player lays out lay uh, something happened with the amp, you can still carry that groove being a drummer. And what I learned from Dave Waco is that sing what you play. Yes, absolutely. You yeah. know, he said, if you can't sing it, you can't play it. Yeah, that's right. I, I'm i glad you mentioned that. I have a 15-year-old student, drum student, and we've been. he came to me because he's a jazz player and wanted to learn rock. So we learned a few rock songs, and then I decided to teach him a pretty hairy progressive rock song that's instrumental. It's, it's two drummers because it's live, and it's Phil Collins and Chester Thompson playing a live version of Los Sandos. And it's pretty really? complicated. And I told him that what I've done my whole life to learn very long pieces of music is I've memorized what every instrument is doing. And exactly what you just said, you should be able to sing the bass part, you should be able to sing the guitar part, you should know all the lyrics. That's knowing every twist and turn and rock and mailbox and tree of the map, basically, of that song. And when you can, no matter what instrument you play, if you could sing every part, you'll never be lost. You'll understand the dynamics, you'll understand the phrasing, and it just makes it so much easier to remember the whole thing. And, you know, <clears throat> and a lot of drummers, and blues drums, I go to, uh, uh, I always go to the fusion jazz, like I've been to uh, Philip Erkins, Philip Erkins, Erkins. Yeah. John Patatucci, Mike Stern. Yeah. Uh, I go to those concerts and see those guys because then I ask them questions, you know, and I ask them, I said, how do y'all perceive your music when you play it? And the guy told me, say, well, we play off of each other. So yeah. if I hear I can play off of him, I play it in. If the bass player is too busy, the drummer's got to lay back. If the drummer's busy, then the bass player has got to kind of lay back on right. stuff. You know, here, both of y'all can't be all busy and stuff. You know, so you got to listen to those cats. Those cats are pros, you know, and read music. And so, and you, you, you just got to, you got to listen to all types of music, man. You can't just listen to one variety of music. That's right. That, no, that, no matter what your favorite is, you've right. got to expose yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's neat because fusion and blues have that thing in common where there's a lot of improvisation and you've got to know who who's on your team and what are their sensibilities and like you said know when to lay back because this guy or girl's going to take off and you know it's all about chemistry and and a little bit of telepathy as well right yeah <laughs> so you know. let's do this i have a special segment that i love to end every interview with and this one today is called the Merrill Perkins fun fact questions. <laughs> so this is a way for everyone to get to know you. I'm going to ask you a series of rapid fire questions that I want you to answer as quick as you can without thinking too okay. much about it. Okay, ready? All right. Okay. Paper or plastic? Plastic. Wheat, white, or rye? Wheat. What's your favorite movie? Horror movies. Ooh, ooh. Do you have a favorite favorite? Is it oldie or something contemporary? Oh, man. I tell you, a movie that scared me to death is The Alien. Oh, I've seen geez. all those movies when I first seen it. Yeah. That scared me. And so it's going even weird was in that movie, man. Yeah. That's the first movie that ever scared me. <laughs> That's great. And Would when you... I was 10 years old, I tell you, another movie scared me, and I was scared to turn the lights and look over the bed was the thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. How about TV shows? Also horror? Do you have a favorite genre for TV? Uh, my t Little Rascals. Uh, man, I love the Little Rascals. Three Stooges. Great. Uh, Laura and Hardy. Man, and it's never be anybody like those guys. You're man. right. Oh, <laughs> legendary. That's hilarious. With all your traveling, What's the one 
place you've never been to that you would love to go to, whether it's to play or visit? Oh, man, I would like to go to Australia and Singapore. Oh, I've been to both. They're both amazing. Uh, I, yeah. Those are the two places. And then uh, another mm-hmm. time, you know, I had put, I wanted to go to Japan. Mm-hmm. That was another, while well, I'm still living. So yeah. uh, with Eddie Clearwater, I went to Japan and Osaka, Japan. Nice. So I got a chance to go Japan's there. Amazing. I, uh, it was a guy, a Japanese friend of mine, had took a picture of me playing, and he also took the video of the same place. So I put the picture in the video on one of my light pages of playing with Eddie Clearwater. Nice. And that, and also I did. I never recorded. Uh, I was with Eddie for 11 years, but he all, when he recorded like three CDs, he always used uh, Duke Overlaw. He would use that. There was a horn band out of Massachusetts. He would always use an established band that was already established. And then um, another CD that he did, he uses um, the Low Straight Jackets. Now, he got nominated for a war with that, the Lowe's Straight Jackets. Yeah. They didn't sing. I don't know if you heard of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Lowe's Straight Jacket. And then the next CD he did was uh, with uh, Lonnie Brooks' son. Lonnie Brooks had two sons, Wayne Baker Brooks and Ronnie Baker Brooks. And I, when we used to practice, they were little kids. But those, those little boys turned out to be killer guitar players, man, and singers. Yeah, they, they work. Well, they today. had a, they had a little bit of influence. <laughs> right. How you about know, uh, here's three more questions. What was your first car? What was my first car, man? Was um, I was working a job. Was a '57 Ford. Nice uh, hard top convertible. You know the top was Popped hard, off. but yeah. it but it would come back. Yeah. So that's it was '57 awesome. Ford. And first, what's your dream car? Oh, man, I'll tell you what I always wanted to be. You know, I had two motorhomes. I always either wanted to be a bus driver, Greyhound bus driver, or a truck bus driver, or drive a semi-trailer truck. Oh, wow. So when I had my band, I, you know, I rode, rode in a, a 20G band. So I bought a used motorhome, a uh, Tasca, uh, 27 inch. Nice. I bought it, and then that's what we traveled in. And then I traded that in because they make motorhomes in Indiana. That's next to Chicago. So I traded that motor in, motorhome in, and I bought a brand new one. Nice. That's and awesome. And I was the only drummer, only musician in Chicago that had a motorhome. <laughs> that's cool. Last question, what is the best advice you ever received and who gave it to you? Okay, Junior Wells. Junior Wells was very comical. And when I was booking uh, my band, uh, he told me, he said, you know, the best thing to do when you when you try to book your band on your own, they're going to try to do you down as much as they can. And he said, it's more professional when you have somebody that does that for you. Because it's more impressive. They can't do a booking agent down. Right. Because what agent's going to do that? That's the best advice I got for the band. Uh-huh. Now, I tell you somebody that I got a radio interview with, and you probably know him. He's uh, from South Africa. Yeah. Uh, Lil, Lil D. The drummer called Lil D. Yep. When I saw him, he just blew me away. Really? And at 13 years old, I never seen anybody play like that. Yeah. So my friend, I got a friend that's uh, named Eddie Freeman that has a radio station in Florida called The Train. So I hooked him up with Lil D, a radio interview with mm. him. Nice. That's so, awesome. Yeah. We're going to have to do this again. There's so yeah. much more to talk about. We'll talk about that. Stay on the line with me after we say goodbye. A couple more hellos. Watching from Nepal. I think that's Rashish in disguise, possibly. <laughs> and my son <laughs> is chiming in saying, Alien and the Thing are amazing sci-fi horror films. I told you my son writes novels before we started, and he writes in fantasy, horror, comedy, fiction. 
puts that all together. So maybe someday you guys could get together, talk old horror movies. Oh um, man. I, when I was coming up when I was 13, I seen it conquered the world. Corona is a she creature, yeah. creature from the black lagoon. Yeah. Uh, you know, all those, all the traded invasion of the space, man. Yeah. My mom yeah. was a huge uh, Boris Karloff and Vincent Price fan. Wow, oh, yeah, Vincent Price and, uh, and uh, the original Bella, Frankenstein. Bella, Boris. Bella, Bella, Bella Lugosi, yeah. And uh, my mother's favorite actor was uh, Lee Van Cleve. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the yeah. good, bad, and the ugly. Yeah. Oh, you and no. my wife will have to chop it up about old movies. She's an old, old music, but music. And yeah, music, um, old jazz and Fred Astaire is her favorite dancer and actor. And he's a great, he oh, was a great yeah. drummer, but old movies too. You get, you'll, we'll have to do a call where we all just kind of chat together. We'll do yeah. a happy hour. Yeah. 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 And I got to give a shout out to the guys at Soul Tone. You're wearing the shirt. Hope you guys are watching. Yeah. If not, we'll share this to them. Have good yeah. friends over there. They make a great product. You know, my friend that lives in Las Vegas, uh, I, I've been his mentor when I, uh, uh, he was a little boy, he used to watch me. Now he lives in Las Vegas and he's a phenomenal drummer. His name's Stix Tiller. I know Stix, yeah. Stix I've Tiller. Known, I've known Stix the whole time we've been doing uh, Drum Talk TV, yeah. He, he the one that hooked me up with the Soul Tone Symbols. That's awesome. My, uh, our son, Kevon, who's an entertainer in Vegas, um, has played with Sticks a few times before. Kevon is a singer, dancer, singer, works the room like nobody out there. And he's, he and Sticks have hooked up a few times and played. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, hey, Sticks. This troll and Sticks is yeah. lit up. And, uh, you know, he always sent me his songs. And I said, oh, man, that's he's awesome. smoking. And then I, I had have no another... idea we had that connection. Yeah, I have another friend that is Robert Shifley. I know Robert Shipley as well. That's yeah. he's from Chicago. Yeah, yeah, that's my friend. And that's then awesome. uh, uh, another uh, bass player that was staying there. I don't know if he still stay there. Um, uh, what's his name? Is uh, Al, Al Allen? His last name is Allen, but he's from Chicago. I um, can't think of his last name, man. Uh, Jimmy Allen. Oh, Jimmy Allen. Okay. I think I've seen him play Bass player. Because we, I started Drum Talk TV in Vegas. We were living out there when I first started. From two, we, I started it in January 2013. We moved out to Arizona in 2016, I think. Yeah, but we'll have to get together, do a happy hour and talk offline. Thanks yeah. again, Merle, for taking time yeah. in the evening to join us. Yeah. Folks, thank you for following Merle and myself here, share it around with some friends who love talking old school music, old school drumming, and some musical mm -hmm. history. And um, hang on the line, Merle, after I say yeah. goodbye. And folks, thank you so much for following Drum Talk TV. It means everything to me. We've got some great stuff planned for this year and some more interviews. And be sure to tell a friend. Otherwise, put your head down for a five-minute timeout. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Yes. Yeah.